Raise your hand. We would love to get you a Bible right now. If you do have your Bible, let's turn to Joshua. Did you guys enjoy Joshua last week? All right, yes. The main message of last week in Joshua chapter one is simply what? It's really two points. Two points is really the key of the whole thing, and I'm gonna pick up in the third point that we just kind of hit. But basically, if you were to say to somebody, what was Joshua one about, what would you say? Be bold, be strong, why? For the Lord thy God is with you. Let's say it out loud together. Let's go, one, two, three, go. Be bold, be strong, for the Lord thy God is with you. I mean, if we could just get that into our heads, what a change it would be on how we walk into the workplace in the morning, amen? How you doing inside? I'm bold and I'm strong because the Lord God is with me. <laughs> now, you're not gonna say that. You're gonna like, oh, what's up? But you would understand that you have that presence guiding you, directing you, blessing you. But before he could even hear those words, what had to happen in his life? Verse one, Joshua 1.1, 1, 1, what's it say? First four words. Moses, my servant is dead. And my challenge to us was what needs to change? What is the new season in our life? What has there been old habits, old dependencies, and maybe even good things? Moses was a good and godly man, but there was time for a new venture of faith, and it took the fact that no longer are you to be following this man. You are now to be following directly my word, will, and and way. And so he continues, and we saw over and over, be bold, be strong, be bold, be strong. And why? Because you're leading God's people, and the people need to see that. And they said, oh, just as we obeyed Moses, we'll obey you. And he went, ah! And God said again, be bold and be strong. And then it ended with them saying, hey, the people said, hey, be bold and be strong. But then the third point that I hit with you, number one, Things have got a guy. We're too often trying to add things in. We remember throughout the scripture, in the, the year of King Uzziah's death, I saw the Lord. It took Uzziah to die in order for Isaiah to see the Lord. What is it in your life? I could show you point after point after point tonight where there needed to have the old pass away so that the new could come. I don't know what that is, but you do. Whether it's a relationship, it's a business, it's a bad habit, a lie, a compromise, let it die, let it go. So God can say, listen, trust me. I know you don't like the pain, but you're saying to me tonight, but I know the pain. At least the pain is better than the fear of the unknown. God is saying, no, be bold, be strong, for the Lord your God is with you. I will go forth before you, and I will be your rear guard. So let go and let God be God. Let God be God and to step out. And so he's encouraging that. But then he said, the next thing you need to do is, anyone remember? Prepare. Prepare. And I came kind of, guys, this is a problem I see in our generation. We're sitting around and waiting for God to do all the work. And God said, no, I am going to rock your world, but I need you to prepare. And as I see even tonight, those of you who have come with a Bible in your hand, with a notebook and a pencil, guess what? You're going to be blessed. Why? Because you came prepared to be blessed. You go fishing with a net, you catch fish. Unless you put a guido not a fish. You show up without a net, you're probably not going to catch much. You know, I don't know about you, but I've been surfing my whole life since I was four years old. And I've never gone surfing without a surfboard. I've never shown up to play tennis without a tennis racket. I've only golfed twice, but both times I showed up with clubs. But I find it ironic how many people come to a Bible study without a Bible. How many times we go to our home groups or we spend our time and we don't create the context for God to bless us. Prepare ye this day for in three days hence I am going to take you into the promised land. Whoa! And that is where we're picking up tonight is this context now of what was he supposed to do? So taking notes, jot down. How do we prepare? What was he supposed to do to prepare? What does preparing look like? And that is what we're going to look at tonight. So with that in our mind, let's pray. Father, I come now and I ask for you, the Spirit of living God, just to fall afresh upon us. Lord, all of us in this area right now, we need to decrease, Lord, that you would increase in us, through us, and upon us. I pray now tonight that the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts will be acceptable in your sight. O oh Lord, our rock, our redeemer. Jesus, tonight, we give you permission to write on our hearts. Amen, church? Write upon our hearts, God. Write upon us. Stir us up, O oh God. Have your way with us because we don't want to just be left in the merry wandering land. Lord God, we want to go further. We want to grow. We want to be deeper. And so, Lord, take us tonight. Take us where we need to go and grow. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, now, if we understand that, then we have to understand what? God says this, you need to prepare. Why do you need to prepare? He said, because in three days, in three days, you're gonna go in. So when he says prepare because three days, what is that really saying that he needed to do? He needed to get some things done, but at the same time, he also needed to 
wait. Anyone here have the spiritual gift of waiting? In fact, I put my glasses on because I really want to meet you. <laughs> you know, when they were passing out the wait card, that one just, I, I missed that plate. I missed that whole thing, you know. Waiting, I hate to wait. Is there any amens out there? I mean, I, oh. I would go into the bank at Molokai and there'd be two people in line and I'd turn around and leave and try to come back later. <laughs> Forgot how spoiled I was and I came over here and I was like, oh, the line is going to zigzag. They got that Disneyland thing going. I'm like, huh? Forget about it. I don't need money and I'd walk out. <laughs> I go hungry already. I really I do. I struggle with waiting. Some of you are like, yeah, we know. Okay. But when we are waiting, tonight I want to show you that two things are taking place. One, Joseph is doing, uh, Joshua is doing what he needs to be doing, and he is preparing, and I'm going to show you how he's preparing in these two folds. But also, in their waiting, God is at work. Tonight, some of you, you are sitting and you are waiting. You're saying, brother, I've been waiting a long time. I need you to know that God is at work. And that's where I want you to be stirred tonight is that we only see things in this level, but it's a multifaceted tapestry that our Lord is working for us. So what did the first preparation look like? If you're taking notes, it's called the plan. The plan. So tonight we're going to look at the first part of the preparation. I'm telling you there's two things that we're going to see going on tonight, two reasons why they had to wait for three days. Number one is the plan. And so the first thing we're going to see is he sends in spies. Joshua is about to send in spies. Now, you Bible students, does that sound familiar at all? Is there anything deja vu going on? Why? Because Moses sent who? Joshua. He was one of the spies. Only he and Caleb were the only two that came back. And so, you know, I'm saying this in a positive way. The monkey see, monkey do. My mentor sent in spies. I am now in charge. I am the general. God is going to give us victory, but it wouldn't hurt to know where we're going. Where are the fords? Where are the opportunities? Where are the weak spots? Where so that as I am being led by God, I have been prepared. As I learned in seminary, I have taught you, prepare like it all depends upon you. Show up knowing it all depends upon him. And it is so critical. And that is why I spend the time in study. I don't just have the book and sleep with it on my head. and say, I'm going to show up and just let the Lord lead me. No, it's time to study so that we can be used of God. Amen? So let's get into the study. Joshua chapter 2. Then Joshua, the son of Nun, sent two men as spies secretly from Shittim. Now let's stop right there. Something is different here. Has anyone picked up anything different from this time from when he was sent? How many did he send? Just two. Last time it was? Okay, it was actually 12. Okay, 10 gave a bogus report and, and the, the two gave the positive report. So there was 12, this time it's two. Then also, what else is different? What does it say about this, uh, this mission? Secret. So put it in there. It's a special op. Covert. They're going commando, a ranger, Navy SEAL, GI Joshua. All right, now. So G.I. Josh is now sending in these spies secretly. Now, anyone want to think with me, why would this time be different? Why would he do it secretly other than the last time when it was the big dun 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 and let's grab one from every tribe and everybody winning? Two reasons. First of all, they wanted to make sure one thing, their safety. Their safety. If I send these guys in just two, the covert, they can get in and they can get out. Their safety. And so as a wise general, he has a very practical reason for their own safety. Again, loose lips sink ships. So hey, the less people know about it, the better these two guys can go in because all I need is to go and know where we're going to go. So that's all I need. He already knows he's called to go, but he needs to know where and how, so he just needs the two guys. The second reason, why does he have this mission on a secret mission? Is because Joshua does not want to have the problem that happened last time. You see, if the whole nation knows about it, and these guys come back, and they give an ill report, Joshua's like, I ain't doing another 40. And you know, there's wisdom in that. There's wisdom in not giving room for the enemy to throw fear and doubt into other people's hearts and minds. I think sometimes one of the silliest things we can do is have a Bible study when we read a verse and we sit down and we go, okay, now, what does this mean to you? And we go around and each of us shares what it means. You know what, can I say in love? It doesn't matter what it means to you. What matters is what did Paul mean when he wrote to the church in Ephesus? There is one interpretation, there is many application, amen? 
You see, if we have the what's it mean to you, then we leave with our collective ignorance. Here, what we need to say is, Lord, what does it mean to you, God? What is your purposes? And so he sends these two in secretly because I don't want to give a platform so that we would walk in fear again. No, 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 we're going to walk in faith. God has told me, Commander General G.I. Josh, that I need to go. Now I'm doing the intel. Are you with me? Okay. Uh, it wasn't really allowed, yes, but I'm, I'm believing you're out there. Okay, now. So, then Joshua, the son of Nun, which means he was an orphan, sent two men as spies secretly to Shittim. Go, view the land, and underline especially where? Jericho. All right, that's where we're going to go first. So, they went and came to the house of a harlot whose name was Rahab and lodged there. Now, any of you Bible students out there said, what are two good little Jewish boys going to a harlot for? I mean, the first thing he says, yep, they went, they went into town, they went into a harlot. It's like, uh, okay, you want to time out here? Just little extracurricular activities here. You know, these are just typical sailors. I mean, what's going on here? Why would they be going there? Now, these are men that are called and set apart by God. Why are they going there? Are they going there for some kind of sexual pleasure reasons? No, there was a strategic reason that they went to the place of a harlot. Anyone figured out why? There you go. Some of you said, less suspicious. If there's any home in the community that is used to having wayward travelers come in and out, it would be where? The harlot. And so as they come into town, in order for them to be able to walk through town, if they see someone is beginning to look at them, they're noticing people recognizing them as strangers, what would be their cover? They would go, and they would go into this place. And so as they go, they go into Rahab's house. Now, how would they know that Rahab's house was, or that Rahab was in fact a, a, a harlot or a, a madam or whatever words that you want to use. How would they know that? Jot this down somewhere. In that day, the tradition was is that they would paint the windowsill red. So when you were coming in and all the houses are made of brick, how would you know? Well, the windowsills were made out of wood. And so you would have stone, but then you would have wood inside where lats and hinges could be put on to close the doors or the, or the windows during the, during the rain. So the windowsill itself would be painted red. And so the all the way back to today with the red shoes, it goes all the way back, folks. The red windowsill was what signified and said, hey, this is a woman of, the, of, of hire. And so for that reason, they're coming into town saying, hey, people are looking at us. Let's go here so that we will not be discerned as being as of the land of Israel or here on another mission. So scripture says that they went to the house of a harlot whose name was Rahab and lodged there. We need to spend the night, so we're going to go there. Now, we're going to believe in faith that these two guys were of, of uh, upright. They went in in twos and holding one another accountable. I'm sure they were not involved in anything funky whatsoever. Now, it was told to the king of Jericho, saying, Behold, the men, the sons of Israel, have come here tonight to search out the land. Now, what does verse 2 tell me? Verse 2 tells me that Hawaii isn't the only place that has nosy neighbors. Okay, this is the truth. They're making all the air, like, oh, 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 oh. And so all of a sudden, the coconut wireless, you know, gets all the way down. The king hears, hey, I think those guys are Israelites, and they think they've come in, and they're in that Rahab's place. And so he hears word of it. And as he hears word of it, then what happens? Verse 3, and the king of Jericho sent word to Rahab, saying, bring out the men who have come to me, who have entered your house, for they have come to search out the land. But the woman, this is Rahab, had taken the two men and hidden them. And she said, yes, these men came to me, but I did not know where they were from. And it came about that when it was time to shut the gate at dark, that the men went out, and I did not know where the men went. Pursue them quickly, for you will overtake them. Verse 6, but... She had brought them up to the roof and hidden them in the stalks of the flax. And she had laid in order that she had laid, excuse me, on the roof. So the men pursued them on the road to the Jordan to the fords. As soon as those who were pursuing them had gone out, they shut the gate. Now, what did she do? Okay, they come down, the guards come in, bang on the door. Hey, in the name of the king, open up. She opens up the doors. They said, hey, there's guys that are here from Israelites and they're here to spy out the land. And what does she say? She said, I didn't know where they're from and, and, and they've left. What did she do? She lied. Okay. Now, one of the things that uh, Tony Evans said years ago, and I love it, it definitely ministers to me all the time, what's the job description of a sinner? They sin. Okay. So here we have to understand something. Does the Bible say that God told her to lie? 
No. Here we find a woman who is an unbeliever at this moment, and I'm going to explain. I'm going to go like this as far as an unbeliever, meaning a non-regenerate, non-born again, non-raised under the law. She is doing as is customary in her town as well as in every town, and that is covering your own skin, say whatever it takes, and so she is living a carnal person in a carnal lifestyle, doing a carnal thing, and that is saying, hey, I don't even know where those guys are from. Oh, yeah, and they left. She's lying. My point Let me bring it all through when I get to the end. But here she is doing what she thinks is the right thing, but she's doing it a wrong way. God will never ask you to do a right thing a wrong way. Another way of saying it, God will never ask you to break one rule in order to keep another. God will never ask you to break one rule in order to keep another. I mean, I don't know about you, but I think one of my favorite commercials is that one from Geico when it talks about was was Abraham an honest man. Um... You know what I'm talking about? Not Abraham, uh, Abe Lincoln, thank you. It was Abe Lincoln, an honest man, and she's like, does this dress make my backside look big? And Abe's all. (laughs) And she's like, oh, and she walks off and all this kind of stuff. Listen, gentlemen, if you ever get put in that situation, your wife says, hey, does this dress make me look? And it, you know, all you need to say is, I like the blue one better. (laughs) All right, right there, right there you go. You smell like roses, everything is great. You don't need to lie. Your wife doesn't want you to lie. She doesn't want you to say, yeah, it looks great, and it doesn't. Then you spent money, she spent money on something that is not good. But we don't need to lie. So now we see that that's what she's done because that's all she knows how to do. Verse 7 says that they went out and dug out. Now, verse 8. Now, before they laid down, she came up to them on the roof. This is how I know it's a lie. Before they even laid down, now it kind of goes meanwhile, or back at the ranch, before this happened, Before they lay down, she came up on the roof and she said to the men, I know that the Lord has given you the land. Would you underline that right there? Who is Rahab? A citizen of where? Jericho. So she's a Jerichoite. And I tried. And what's the first word she says to these guys? I know that God has given who the land? Whoa. Whoa. First, that ought to call our attention. Her first words are, she's using the word God. I know the Lord. Whoa, interesting. How do you know about our Lord? How do you know there even is a Lord? I know the Lord has given you the land, and that the terror of you has fallen on us, and all the inhabitants of the land have melted away before you. Now, if you guys had been with me as we consistently went through the Old Testament, the first thing you would see here is you would go, yes! This is once again the fulfillment because God means what he says. He says what he means. Look on the side if you would. What did God say about when he was going to send his people out all the way back in Exodus? He said, I will send my terror ahead of you and throw into confusion all the peoples among who you come and I will make all your enemies turn their backs to you. Then in Deuteronomy in chapter 2 says the same thing. This day I will begin to put the dread and fear of you upon the peoples everywhere under the heavens whom when they hear the report of you shall tremble and be in anguish because of you. And you see we're about to hear in a moment that the word of God had gone forth and the victories of God's people as they were taking them through and all the way from the Red Sea and all the way from the Egyptians being wiped out 40 years ago and now bringing them to this place. There was the rumor, the word, the hear of a great and awesome and mighty God. Folks, that has not changed. God is still large and and there's still a great fear of God and that is why he's constantly being slandered and attacked in the media and everything else as I was sharing with somebody on the beach just yesterday or the day before. The only genuine, or excuse me, the only tax team go after the genuine. You, don't, you leave all the phonies alone and why is it that it is God's name, it is God's word, it is the name of God that is constantly being blasphemed. And so now she says here in verse nine, I know that the Lord has given you land and the terror of you has fallen on us. So right there in your Bible, Exodus 23, Deuteronomy 2, put these in your Bible. You see this here is fulfillment. Why? Verse 10, for we have heard how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea before you when you came out of Egypt and what you did to the kings of the Amorites who were beyond the Jordan and Sihon and Og and how you utterly destroyed. Verse 11, and when we heard it, our hearts melted and no courage remained in any man any longer because of you. For the Lord your God, what's it say, church? He is God in heaven above all earth and beneath. Now, here are some things that are amazing. 
All of the people are hearing the same report of this great and mighty move, this miraculous move with this God, that in these days, gods were territorial gods. Remember, you had Jacob, who, who Laban thought that Jacob had stolen his gods. I'm like, what kind of God do you want that get stolen? But these territorial mindsets of gods, and so these gods of these people, this guy, this is amazing because all the way back 40 years ago in Egypt and then coming all the way through, this God is an amazing God. Your God is an awesome God. But what was happening is, is that as folks would hear this, they all were struck with fear. But please hear me, please hear me, because I don't know where you are tonight. I don't know who's watching me on TV tonight, but I'm gonna say this. Every person, when they come to an understanding of the strict and clear and holy God, the first thing is fear. The question is, where do you go with that fear? You and I both know on on, um, September 11th, when you were woken by telephone calls of saying planes have flown into the buildings. People were questioning, non-believers were questioning, is this it? Is this the judgment of God? Are we entering into this final holocaust? I had men who were calling me up who had been unfaithful to their wives and were repenting because they did not want to die with this sin. And so they were saying, I need to confess to my wife. I need to call her and tell her because the fear came forth. But you see, when this happens, this fear of an awesome and holy God, then it's going to cause people to say either one of two things. Will I surrender and submit and acknowledge this fear? Or how can I fight and battle and combat this fear? And so you're going to find the rest of this nation, these, these folks in Jericho, they see this awesome and mighty God, but they're saying, but we need to fight against him tonight. Don't fight against him. God is thoroughly a loving God. He loves you just as you are. There's no need to fight. He doesn't want you to fight. He's taken away the fight, but if you continue to fight, you can. But you see, everyone heard the same report, but maybe tonight you're going to be Rahab. Maybe you're going to be the one that here is a woman who is a woman of irreproach, She does not have a reputation that is positive. She's lived a lifestyle that is not holy and wholesome, but she has heard and seen the righteous presence, holiness, and power of God, and she recognizes the Lord, he is God. And she comes to these guys and says, you're God, no one can do what I see doing on. The Lord, he is God. And so for that reason, I am here and I am here to protect you because I want to be aligned when it comes time for head count. I want to be aligned with you. Tonight, if there is a head count tonight, if there is a rapture tonight, are you going to be aligned with us? The answer is going to be, you're not here. If you're sitting in a chair, if, this, if that trumpet comes before this message, you're not a part of the family of God. I'm not asking whether you agree. I'm asking if you, if you have an agreement or a knowledge of. A knowledge of the word of God, agreement with the word of God, doesn't mean harmony with God. It doesn't mean we're walking in obedience. And that's critical that we understand this. And we're going to see something here tonight in this woman, in this Rahab, that the world would have judged as a reject, as the furthest one who would be a person who would be known as a Christian. It is Rahab tonight who we will see is the Christian. And what did it take? Well, continue to read with me. So now as we see her doing something in verse 11, and when we heard of it, our hearts melted, and no courage remained in any man any longer because of you. For the Lord, your God, he is God. You know what it says in Romans 10? It says that if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. Notice, for with the heart the man believes, resulting in righteousness, and with the mouth he confesses, resulting in salvation. She is not just living this fear. She's saying, the Lord, he is good. The Lord, he is God. She believes it enough to confess it, which is why at the end of every sermon, Sunday or Wednesday, I will say, hey, raise your hand. I don't do every head bow. Because he says, if you believe and you confess, then it's true and it's legit. You don't want anyone to, you're not afraid of knowing truth when you know what truth is. Amen? And so here we see, Her proclamation. Now this ought to blow your mind because first of all, notice, what do we see about Rahab? Number one, she was a sinner. But notice, she recognized that she was under condemnation. We recognize that, oh, when we heard everything that was going on, we fell in fear. She recognizes that because she was a sinner, that she was an enemy of God. She recognized that she was under condemnation, but what did she do? She now did what? She heard the word of God. She heard the way of God. She heard the authority of God. And now we're gonna see that she believes. She responds. She says, the Lord, he is God. What does it take tonight? The exact same thing. You here tonight, 
You're a sinner, so am I, don't be offended. That's the description, because none of us are perfect. But then from there, recognizing that there, and because all we like sheep have gone astray, that the wages of sin is death, we are under condemnation. And so she recognized that, but then went further. She then heard the word of God, and then she put her faith in God. And that is exactly what happens. Now, verse 12. Now, therefore, please swear to me by the Lord, since I have dealt kindly with you, that you would also deal kindly with my father's household and give me a pledge of truth. Fear my father and my mother and my brothers and my sisters and all who belong to them and deliver our lives from death. Now here's the thing. Not only did she believe, but this, she believed and was convinced of God's coming wrath. Can I have your attention tonight just for a second? I want to ask us, are we convinced and do we believe of God's pending wrath? You know, that's just a word that it's like they don't even preach it anymore. I mean, sure, it was abused in the times of the 40s and the 50s and the hellfire damnations, and so we ran to this gentle Jesus, meek and mild, and we ran. But folks, the Bible does say that there is a wrath, there is a judgment for sin, and there is a consequence to it. And we have so removed it that anyone who wants to do any kind of judgment, they're a bad person. Rather than the person who has done bad, it's rather the righteous who are gonna bring forth the judgment. Our society has completely turned the tables and said, that is unloving, that is unkind, that is bad, rather than living in what is true and what is right and what is honorable and also respecting the giver of life, which is God. And I really don't believe that we believe in a pending wrath. We do not believe that the judgment of God could come tomorrow. I really don't think we believe as much that the judgment of God is on any life that stops at any moment. So the moment tonight, if you die and you do not have your name in the book of life, as I showed you in Revelation, you got the books and the book, and if your name is not in the book of life, you do not go before the Bema Seat. You will be standing according to the Bible, according to your deeds. You see, she recognized God's judgment is coming, and so for that reason, she was motivated. And we hear all this, oh, I don't want to be motivated because of hell. Listen, I think it's okay to scare the hell out of you. And to share it with your friends as well. Because I believe in a moment, in twinkling of an eye, we will be raptured. I believe that if I have an aneurysm and I drop dead, I'm not going to have time to prepare. So the preparation better be done here and now tonight. Amen? Amen. And that is what we need to bring it back. Speak the truth in love. I'm not asking for a bunch of sandwich board holders out there. The end is near. But I do want us to say, hey, do you know that the end could be near? And if you're reading the paper, it looks a whole lot nearer every day. That's the question we need to ask ourselves. Do I believe? Rahab believed, and it did something. It not only saved her, but she was now motivated to save her family. She believed so much that she said, I want them. Verse 14, so the men said to her, our life for yours. If you do not tell this business of ours, and it shall come about that when the Lord gives us this land, which underline that, I love that, not if, They're agreeing with her. Yep, God's going to give it to us. Yep, so when he gives us this land, that we will deal kindly and faithfully with you. Then she let them down by a rope through the window, for her house was on the city wall, so that she was living on the wall. Now, I need you to understand something. Um, Most of you have seen pictures and depictions of the walls in these days. And the walls were so wide in many of the cities that I've taken to you that you could have three to four chariots wide riding crazy. These aren't walls like the, like the rock wall you get in front of your house. Now, how you get the house on top of that? No, that's not what I'm talking about. Okay? I am talking about walls that you can have three to four chariots across. And so the community and so people would build their houses on that. But I need you to understand something. That word on can also be misleading because it does not necessarily mean that her house was on the wall, but that it backed up to the wall. And it is very common. Any of you have been in Israel today when you're walking down the market, when you go through the Jaffa Gate and you're coming through all those homes, all those places that are backing up to the wall. So the back, the window that you see from the outside of the old city wall, those windows go into those homes and into those businesses. And so very likely when it says it was on the wall, meaning it had been on the wall, not necessarily on the top of the wall. Could have been either or. But we know that she had an outside window and that was which was painted red and that was where she was letting these spies down. And that's what it says in the scripture. Now, verse 16. And she said to them, go into the hill country, lest the pursuers happen upon you, and hide yourself there for three days until the pursuers return. Then afterwards, you may go your way. And now I find it interesting that she said three days, because what did Joshua get told? Three days. Is there a plan? 
Yup. Is there an architect? Yup. His name is God. Jesus. All right. Now, also notice if you pay attention when it says over here, she sent the guys, the runners down this way towards the west. She's telling these guys now go up and hide in the mountains in the east. So she's very strategic in what she's doing so that they would be protected and be able to protect her family. Now, Verse 17, and the men said to her, we shall be free from this oath to you, which we have made us swear, unless when we come into the land, you tie this cord of scarlet thread in the window through which you let us down and gather to yourselves in the house of the father and your mother and your brothers and all of your family's household. And it shall come about that anyone who goes out from the doors of their house into the street, his blood shall be on his own head and we shall be free. But anyone who is underlined, who is with you in the house, his blood shall be on our head if a hand is laid on him. But if you tell this business of ours, then we shall be free from our oath, which you have made us swear. And she said, according to your words, so be it. So she sent them away, and they departed. And she tied the scarlet cord in the window. And they departed and came to the hill country and remained there for three days until the pursuers returned. Now the pursuers had sought them all along the road, but had not found them. I think that's kind of funny because, you know, in the Bible it says, and you seek, you will find. It works both ways. Because if you're being hidden by the Lord, you won't be found. One of my favorite stories, one of my favorite heroes was a kid by the name of Brother Andrew. Anyone remember Brother Andrew? Brother Andrew was a guy who years, I mean, he's got documentation of years, and he wrote a book called God's Smuggler. For years, he would take Bibles into Russia, communist Russia, and he would go right to the border, and the cars in front of him would be stripped, jacked up, tires taken off, hubcaps, everything kind of, and he would go through, and he had suitcases and suitcases and suitcases full of Bibles in the suitcases, in his trunks, in the back seats, and they would take his car, and they would either just say, next, and put them right through, or they would just stop the car, open it, and look up, this, and they would look, and they would just move. God completely blinded their eyes, and they never saw this culture man for 20 years as he drove Bibles into Russia. Because God is large and, you see, be bold, be strong. Why? I want to have that. Okay. Be bold, be strong. Why? For the Lord that God is with you. Say it like you mean it. Say it like he is the God who is with us. It is awesome as we understand what is going on here. You see, here's the thing that we have to understand is that these guys are saying, listen, God is protecting us. And so that for that reason, they were not taken captive. Verse 23, then the two men returned and came down from the hill country and crossed over and came to Joshua, the son of Nun. And they related to him all that had happened to them. And they said, Joshua, Surely the Lord has given us all the land into our hands and all the inhabitants of the land, moreover, have melted away before us. He's like, oh, it's just as was told to Moses. It's happening. The people are afraid and God has given us the land. You see, the first report came back, you know, two yes, 10 no. These two come back and say, oh, the Lord, he is good. The Lord, he is God. God is at work. Amen. Amen. Okay, so I told you there's two things that needed to take place. God says, prepare for in three days, we're going to go in. First thing we needed to do was the plan. The plan was to send out these spies and get the plan. Figure out where in the spot, where would the wall, where would there be a breach, where would God want us to go in and to understand the context of their battle. It's a smart thing to do. Any good general knows two things. He knows himself, his army, and his enemy. And that is what he's sending him to do. But there was a second reason now that we had to wait these three days. Jot this down. There was a soul to be saved. There was a soul to be saved. I can stand in front of you tonight and say part of the reasons that an entire nation waited three days is because God had a work to do in Rahab's life. This is the heart of your God. He waited for Lot to come out before he would bring in the destruction. He waited for Noah and the family to get into the ark before he would bring forth the destruction. He waited for Rahab to be able to confess and to profess. He knew in the midst of this carnal that there was one who was seeking, one who was searching, one who knew her lifestyle was empty, and for that reason, she didn't have to clean up her act and come follow Jesus. She just had to acknowledge who God was, and God began to change and transform her act, because what did she do? She did as it says in the scripture. She confessed and she believed, and how did this take place? Well, we're gonna see what happens, but the point that I think is kind of funny is I can imagine that these these two spies probably thought it was their idea that they were about to protect this girl. You know what we're going to do? This gal, she, you know, she, so what we're going to do for her is this. In reality, 
Why would we have this detail in the Bible? Because God wants every single Rahab to know that I see you, I care for you, and I will stop the whole world for you if you will just come home. Amen? There is no Rahab that God doesn't love. There is no Rahab who is beyond the call, the purposes, and the plans, and the covenants of God. You see, the city was under God's judgment. But because of her faith, she became a sharer in all of the blessings, which I will tell you in a moment. But here, the city is under judgment. It's not about the city. It's not about the surroundings. It's about her confession, her profession, who God is. And for that reason, as it says in 2 Peter 3, the Lord is not slow about his promise, as some count slowness, but is patient towards you, not wishing for any to perish, but for all to come to repentance. 2 Peter 3, 9. The Lord is not slow about his promise, as some count slowness. Some of you go, Man, where's God? How come he hasn't come back yet? Because he's still caring for the one last Rahab that needs to give her life, his life, to Jesus tonight. Amen? Wouldn't it be cool if this is the final place where God finally needed waiting for the last person? So I'm at the end, and like, hey, and tonight, if you'd like to raise your hand and select Jesus Christ your Lord, and you raise your hand, and poof, and we're all gone. <laughs> As we're going up, it was you, dude, yeah. <laughs> that would be so hot. <laughs> but he's not slow, as some call slow, but is patient towards you, not wishing for any to perish, but for all to come to repentance. But I will tell you about this patience. There is a time when the trumpet will blow. So if you keep thinking, well, he's patient, so I got tomorrow, I got tomorrow. Do you? Because judgment day came on Jericho. And judgment day will come on the world, and that is what the Bible says. Now, how did she come to believe? How did she come to believe? Guys, the text tells us. How did she come to believe? She saw and heard the evidences of the supernatural. She didn't read a book. She didn't have a Bible. She she saw and heard the evidence of the supernatural. She saw the mighty and miraculous God. She saw the evidence of an all-speaking, all-credible, all-powerful God. What did she see? She saw the fruit in God's people. Folks, first of all, two things. Number one, let us be humble by that and saying, Lord, are we being a reflection that's causing the people of Honolulu, the people out here looking at me tonight, listening, going, oh, wow, what is it about those guys? What has changed about them? What is this peace, this presence, this power? Is there the fruit of the evidence of a living God? That is one of the first things that we need to be that light, that presence, because that's what called Rahab to the truth. She didn't get a chance to go to Bible study. She saw the fruit of God's people going forth in God's power. And that's the thing that we need to show tonight and saying, Lord, help me to be a clearer and better reflection of who you are. But secondly, we need to recognize that around us, people need to know how much we care before they care how much we know. Listen, it's not just how we believe, but it's how we behave tonight. Not just how you believe, but how you behave. I am sick and tired of hearing and seeing and dealing with Christians who are so right in their doctrine and so wrong on their actions. And we need to say, Lord, begin in my life that I don't just believe well, but I behave well. Any amens there? See, she came to believe because she saw and heard the evidences of the supernatural. Are we proclaiming that? Are we exemplifying it? Are we letting his word be known? Or are we just leaving the work to Kahlo? Well, we got a TV station, and so, you know, I give my money, I support Kahlo. Listen, if you do, that's great. But Kahlo is a voice, not the voice of the church. You are. Amen? Now, how was she recognized as a believer? How was she recognized as a believer? Well, the first thing is cool, as I already told you this, is that she was recognized as a believer because something that she was doing. What was that? The Bible even tells us that. It says in James chapter 2, 18, someone will say, you have faith and I have works. He says, show me your faith without works. He says, but I will show you my faith. How? By my works. You see, not only did she believe, but then she believed and she emphasized her life. She risked her life. She went and she hid them. She made motion of saying, this is the party that I want to be aligned with. And so she wasn't afraid to be seen there. But when she now professed to be and confessed with her mouth, was showing actions and fruit of a believer, then how was she going to be recognized when the armies came in? The answer is a scarlet thread. You see that there? So go back now and underline that if you didn't underline in verse 18. Unless when we come into the land that you tie this card of scarlet thread in the window from which you let us down. Now, let's talk about that. First of all, scarlet is a biblical imagery of what color or of what? Of blood. And more specifically, even the blood of what? Blood of the lamb. 
And so when we talked about the tabernacle and all the different colors, and when we had the scarlet, it was representational of this, the blood of the lamb, the sacrificial lamb, the lamb of atonement for the nation. And so it is not any, they could have picked any kind of rope. Why was it a scarlet one? Again, I show to you tonight, I believe very strongly that there was a message that was being said that it said here, what you need to be, how you're going to be recognized as a believer is because of the scarlet, because the covering of the blood. Now, as I mentioned to you before, the windowsills were painted red. I wonder, I just wonder, if here's her windowsill red, and out comes this cord, this rope, I wonder if she just hung it straight down out the middle, tied it next to a chair or something, and threw it right out the window and let it hang. And there as the nation of Israel comes and approaches, they see there's a believer there because there's a red one of these. Hmm. And what does it say in verse 19? What happens to those who are in here that are in this? Whoa, verse 19 says, and it shall come about that anyone who goes out of the doors of your house into the street, his blood shall be on his own head and we shall be free. But, underline church, anyone who is with you in the house, they are covered. They are protected. You see, tonight, there is a opportunity to come into grace. And I'm gonna show you something even more powerful in the end. But there isn't a one of us here tonight that doesn't get recognized as a believer without the same way. All the way back into Egypt, how did the angel of death know whom to was a believer and whom was not? He was to come by and he was to see the blood of the lamb on this side and on this side and on this and on that. Here we have thousands of years before even Rome existed. Here we have a Roman crucifixion. We have the sign of the cross in the blood of the lamb. Here now we have Jericho about to be taken and those who have come into the covering behind the scarlet, behind the blood, those are the ones in who saved. But whoever goes out, hey, you're on your own. God tonight will let you go back to that parking lot and walk away and go, who that guy not sorry, How long he was going to ramble? Okay, you can. Or you can say, no, there is a clear and definable reason, or there is no clear and definable reason why I should doubt what this guy is saying tonight. And surrender to the truth that'll set you free. The God who died on a cross and paid the price for your sin and mine. We're not blood fixated, we're blood blessed. Because I am blessed because Jesus paid the price for my sin, for your sin, for anyone who would respond. Rahab, hear me tonight, man or woman, Hear me tonight. God loves you. God brought you here tonight. You are not beyond his calling for you, and you know not the hour. Do not wait for tomorrow. Any who go in are safe. Any who do not will not be. They will stand on their own accord. Tonight, as I look at this text, I see about Rahab, what was it? She was a sinner. She was under condemnation, as I showed you, but she heard the word of God. But then she believed, and what did she do? She proved it with obedience in her life. And then what did she do? She sought to win others. She wanted her family to come in, and so let's come and let's bring them. When you believe that it's true, and you know that it's right, you don't want to just hold it to yourself, hoard it to yourself. She wanted others to know, so we know that she is a believer of the authority and the power and the blessing of God, and so she wanted her family to be saved, and thus she too was saved. And then the scriptures tells us that she went in to the promised land. But let me tell you the best part about this story. Some of you who just read this and it ends here tonight will miss the whole plan of God. Because if you know the rest of the story, anybody old enough to know that guy? Okay, and the rest of the story. Rahab is Boaz's mother. Boaz is the man in whom Ruth marries who then becomes the great-grandfather of Jesus Christ, our Savior. You tonight, who are thinking, God can't use me. My pedigree is, mm-mm. Wax, my, I didn't have a, a father and a mother that were Christian like you. My father wasn't a pastor like you. The, folks, in the genealogy of the God of the universe, he chose to use all of us who are like sheep who have gone astray. Amen? His genealogy wasn't a Levite line, which is why today some still have issues with him. But Jesus says, uh-uh, I came to die and to represent humanity. And so I died for them. 
In Hebrews chapter 11, we find that Rahab is listed in the great hall of faith. Wow. This lying prostitute with all of her faulty ways came just as she was. And when she came just as she was, it's all she needed to do. And she was saved. She was saved by God. Now I want you to see something here. Ephesians 2 says, For by grace you have been saved through faith. By grace you've been saved through faith and not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. There's a picture in the Bible that says, let me show you what grace looks like. It's our story tonight. A woman had no reason to be saved in her own right other than God so loved her and had a plan for her. But if we have the rest of the notes, I want you to look at this. Keep going. If you look here in the scriptures, you will see something. It was through a window that there was the spies let out. It was through the window that this cord was to be left. Just for those of you who like to go home on these things, the window is a pictogram in Hebrew of the fifth letter. The fifth letter, as you know, is representation, the number five of what? Of grace. The scarlet, as you recognize, represents Jesus' precious blood. Now notice the thread dangles like blood flowing down from a cross. You see, the thread is bound to a window just as Jesus was bound to the cross to set us free. The grace was shown when he shed his blood, showing his deity for you and me. Notice, the window comes before the thread. Grace flows down from heaven when a man, when a woman receives the grace. They too become royalty. See, this is the hope that we have tonight, that Jesus died on a cross. In Hebrews 11, 1, it comes to mind, and that is the hope. Like this blueprint of a house, faith is the building material. Therefore, the cross is the blueprint, and faith makes the cross a reality in our lives. So tonight, coincidences, window, grace, through grace, by grace we've been saved? No. You got a God who's got a plan. Isn't that good to know? When things go kapakahi tomorrow and a flat tire on the side of the road, God's got a plan. We may not like it. We definitely most of the time don't understand it. But I can trust the architect behind it, and that is God. So tonight, is it your night? In a, in a not a room, in a, in a place, an atmosphere, a courtyard filled with people who have had to come to the same point that tonight, maybe it's your turn to say, Lord, here I am. It's not just agreeing, it's not just knowing, but like Rahab, I need to now put my faith in you and confess to you tonight, Jesus, I need you. I need your forgiveness in my life. I'm not gonna beat it long. I'm not gonna, I'm just gonna give you the invitation. I'm just like somebody who tries to dip and says, well, there's rocks, do you wanna try it? I'm gonna ask you tonight, do you wanna surrender your life to Jesus? Do you know that it's time not to try God, but to surrender to God and ask him to be your Lord and Savior? If you're here tonight and you know that that's what you need to do because honestly, you know that without it, you're under the judgment. And tonight, that's not what you want. You want God's grace and forgiveness and love. The window is open. The window is available. Are you here? Raise your hand, and I want to pray with you. Hold it up nice and high so I can see. I see your brother right over there. Anybody else? Anybody else? That's just saying, hey, tonight, you know what? I don't want to go to hell. There's nothing wrong with saying I don't want to go to hell. And saying, but you know what? I want to also not just not go to hell, but I don't want to live in it anymore. I want to know what it means to live a life with the blessing of Jesus Christ and walk with him in total peace and presence and power. Oh, in this world we have tribulation, but take heart. He is overcome. If you're here tonight and you need to ask God to forgive you of your sin and you need to be born again, raise your hand and let me know before I pray tonight. Anybody else, hold it high so that I can see you. Folks, there's a world that's out there that we need to tell them the truth that will set them free. Amen? Amen, brother. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you. I thank you. I thank you. I come on my knees, Lord, in prayer because we are humbled. That the King of kings, the Lord of lords, the great God Almighty, Lord, would call us and love us and have plans for us. Lord, as we look at Rahab tonight, we look at our own lives and we see, Lord, there is none that is righteous, no, not one. And so, Father, so often we will look and we'll see others and we will distance ourselves thinking, oh, look how far they have to come. There is not a single person who has to come a single distance further than anyone. Repentance is the same step 
for the church going continuous their whole life person to the carnal, godless, wicked person, we only come in through the window, through grace, of the cord, of the blood of Jesus Christ. Repentance is the only way. For you are the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father but through you. And so, Father, we come tonight and we say thank you for your grace. Thank you for your mercy. Thank you for letting us see tonight that there is a plan. Lord, that we would be bold to proclaim you, that, Lord, we would recognize that not only are we ourselves able to come, that any around us are able to come. Lord, let us be those who would proclaim and share with the Rahabs around us, Lord. We want your heart tonight, the heart that waited for Lot, the heart that waited for Noah. Lord, we want your heart to preach, to proclaim, to care. Lord, help us not just to believe, but to behave as Christian. God-fearing, righteous people, showing our faith by our deeds. And Lord, I pray for those tonight, any who need to repent and ask for forgiveness. Lord, they've been walking in rebellion. In rebellion. Take that time right now, dear one. Take that time and just ask God to forgive you. You know you're living in compromise. You know right now you're not doing as God has called you. And so the fruit and the blessing and the manna has not been there. Get right with God tonight. You know there's a friend, a loved one. That like Rahab, you don't want to get left outside. You want them to come into the house. Verse 19 is speaking to you tonight. Then any who will come in shall be saved. But it's only in the house that God built. Pray for that person tonight. Pray for that loved one that your heart would ache and burden. And you would plan a time to just to continue to share your faith with them, to have lunch with them, to speak the truth.